no one else wants to do. So I shall do a quick intro. But beforehand, uh, there are a few people who, uh, we are actually filming this, it's actually being live streamed um, as soon as we can. If you do not want yourself to be filmed, uh, McDonald's is just down the road, so you can get one of those bags, <laughs> stick them over your head, uh, and then no one will be able to see your face. Uh, if that's not an option, um, then you can, uh, well, at the Q&As, the, the cameras all turn towards the audience. Um, so in the interval or before then, you can always run upstairs and go to the balcony upstairs, and you'll be let up there if you do not want to be filmed. It was written on your tickets. Obviously, a lot of you don't read your tickets. Um, so I will introduce uh, all of our lovely speakers um, for London Thinks. Um, if you are um, a member here, thank you very much for turning up. If you are not, uh, we do have forms for Common Hall Ethical Society. Any of the money here goes to our, our charitable aims and causes, which is, involves putting on events like this and supporting our library and other events that we have on throughout the year. Uh, we do try and record and live stream everything to make it available to everyone. We've had probably about half a million people view our videos on YouTube, so it's a big resource for us and for anyone else out there who wants to to watch and view any of the things that we actually do. Um, so thank you for supporting us and being a part of that. So without further ado, Jim, I'm doing all right? It's, uh, yeah, I've got a big thumbs up from my, my CEO at the back there. Um, so without further ado, I shall introduce our speakers, who will give uh, probably 45 minutes of uh, witty banter, um, and then we'll open out to Q&As, and then there'll be uh, book signings with the censored books that you can't get in the States because the publishers have been forced to rescind these books from publication from uh, the litigious people at the Church of Scientology. Um, and you can buy them here in the UK because we're brilliant. <laughs> Simon Singh, thank you very much. Um, oh. We were there. Um, and then we're going to piss off down to the pub. Uh, which is, which is the, the old Nick, which is on Sunderland Street, which is uh, Red, Lion, Red Lion Street down to the side, and you're all welcome to join us afterwards if you want to carry on the conversation and enjoy a few drinks with us before we break up for the summer holidays. So without further ado, um, I welcome to the stage um, BBC Panorama journalist, author of The Church of Fear, John Sweeney. Uh, sitting on John's right-hand side is our uh, Scientology representative, who's there in spirit, uh, in the form of Xenu, uh, Tom Cruise. Everyone a big round of applause, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Uh, to Tom Cruise's right-hand side, we'll introduce the stage, um, Tony Ortega, all the way from the USA. I've already got the seating arrangements coming correctly. Um, and uh, to uh, Tony's left will be Humphrey Hunter, the publisher of all their naughty, naughty books. <laughs> so now I'll leave the stage to these lovely guys. Thank you very much. We've got some tips. Tell them. We have uh, some clips which have not been approved by the Church of Scientology. <laughs> the first one is okay. The second one, if you're hard of hearing, you'll be all right. <laughs> the third one is a statement by the Director General of the BBC. We'll play the clips and then we'll hear from Humphrey. Can you play the second clip? I'm not an expert on brain washing. Uh, 
And now there's a statement from the Director General of the BBC. <laughs> there, there was an advert for injury lawyers for you. The <laughs> so if anyone needs a person here, come on to you. <laughs> Um, to start with, I just my, my role in this is very small, um, really, because all, all I've done really is facilitate the, the work that these two very, very fine gentlemen have done to get out into the public domain. And in this country, to boil a, quite a complicated issue down to really what, what matters, the Church of Scientology makes its position very clear to media outlets about what will happen to them if... Um, if, if they say things that the church doesn't like. And, and I don't mean that in any kind of, they're not going to knock on your door in the middle of the night or do you any harm, but they do effectively threaten to sue you until you cannot take it anymore. Um, but ultimately, um, thanks to John's quite punchy attitude to things, not literally punchy, um, <laughs> attitude to things about, like By this. the way, I'm going to sit on Tom Cruise. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't mind, actually. <laughs> Tom's fine with that. Are there any lawyers in? <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, essentially all I've done is open up the avenues for these two guys to, to, to throw their, their, their content out through. And essentially all it boiled down to was a decision about whether or not what we had was, we, we, justified, we were justified in believing it was true, which you know, film evidence would, would seem to suggest that much of it was true. Um, and there were also a long line of, of ex-Scientologists who... I just want to say, just very, very quickly, who, who when we were going through the, the process before John's first book was published, of, of assessing whether or not we were crazy to do it, which my lawyer did say we were, um, the, the fact that we had these eight or ten or seventeen or how many there were, ex scientologists who were saying, if anything legal kicks off in London, and if there's any kind of court case, just tell us when we need to be there. We will be on a plane and we will be there to help out. So it was those guys who were so willing to, to jump in on our behalf that really made me... Uh, think we could publish it and nothing would happen. And ultimately, um, I have a letter from the church's lawyer saying, if you publish this book, you will be sued. We published the book, we weren't sued. And here we are. So I don't have a very great deal to say, which one is interesting about the inner workings of the church. That's what these two guys are here for. Um, so. Well, can I, can I say something about the video uh, that I hadn't noticed before? Tommy Davis was... Scientology had this interesting uh, strategy for a while that they were very aggressive with the press, like with John, and they had Tommy Davis, who's the son of Ann Archer, the famous actress, and a good-looking kid, um, was uh, clearly in over his head. But there's something interesting he said in that clip, I don't know if you noticed, he said that the definition of religion is very clear in this country, and it really couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, the definition of religion is so impossible to pin down, in my opinion especially in the United States, Scientology will tell you that it has been recognized as a religion in the United States. That is not true. The U.S. Constitution prevents the government from recognizing anything as a religion. All you can do in the United States is get tax-exempt status as an organization with a religious purpose. That's what Scientology has. And whether it's a religion or not is, is a fascinating question and one that I tend to ignore because it, it gets you into such uh, an arcane argument. Uh, there was just an article that came out, I think, yesterday by somebody saying that Scientology is clearly a religion. People are uh, setting out to transform themselves. They're looking to a higher power, L. Ron Hubbard being a higher power to some people. And that they um, go through certain rituals to get there. Um, and so this writer concluded easily that the Church of Scientology is a religion, showing that this writer doesn't know the first thing about Scientology. Um, Scientology is fascinating because it's sold to people as an exact science, not as a religion. If you talk to people that have been in for many years, they'll tell you that what attracted them was that idea that this, this electronic device can help you pinpoint memories from your life going back tens of millions of years. And not just that you were running a prison planet on another solar system 10 million years ago,
but you have to tell the auditor that it was 10 million 452,378 years ago on an October morning, the 12th at 10 a.m. That's how exact Scientology is sold as a science. And in order to progress through Scientology, you are given goals, most of which ultimately come back to flows. The number one thing you can do in Scientology is increase your flows, which is their word for money. The more you can bring in money, the better Scientologist you are. And once you look at these details and the, the, the incredible pressure people are under to advance and do these things that they consider a science, the more you realize it's as far from a religion as you can imagine. It really is. So I'm less interested in whether or not there's a spiritual side to Scientology or not. I'm more interested in what they're doing along the way on that path. They're splitting up families. They're having children working 90 hours a week for pennies an hour. They're, for decades, they forced young women to have abortions because having a baby would keep them from working 100 hours a week. Um, when they bring foreigners over to work in Florida and California, the first thing they do is lock up their passport. And then those folks work for 20 cents an hour for 100 hours a week. I can't think of a better definition of slavery in the United States today than these Scientology workers in Florida and California, and yet Scientology never gets investigated for it or, or, or prosecuted. So it, it's a, that, to me, is a much more interesting question. What they do to people, what they do to families, and less about what Tommy says, that it's obviously a church. It just isn't that easy. I looked up the uh, dictionary definition of a religion a while ago with this very question in mind, and it said that a religion is the belief, fun, well, to sum up a few different versions, the belief in and worship of a higher being. Now, maybe L. Ron Hubbard, to some, is that higher being, but surely that higher being would have to be constant across every, every believer in this religion if it really was a religion. By it's that an interesting question about whether they consider Hubbard God. L. Ron Hubbard uh, was this science fiction writer who came up with his science of the mind. And there's no question that Scientologists hold him in the highest possible esteem. They call him Ron. They think of him as mankind's best friend. Um, they don't like to think that he died in 1986, which he did. <laughs> but he's not a god in the sense that... Um, they, uh, at one point, Hu Hubbard, wanted, Hubbard wanted to be considered a god. And I, I think it's every crackpot's dream, right? And the problem was he wasn't sure if he could quite go there because he had started it as the science of, the mo of, of mental health. And, and he had sold it as a science. And then he had, in 1953, he told one of his followers, let's try the religion angle. He literally said it that way. And, because for tax reasons... And many longtime Scientologists will tell you that they never considered it a church or a religion, that it was just for the tax reasons. Um, but, uh, and uh, if some of the old timers can correct me on this, I think it was the late 70s, Nancy Many told me this for the first time, that Hubbard was tempted. And they actually sent out questionnaires to the people in Scientology, judging their reaction if Hubbard were to announce himself as a messiah. And apparently the questionnaire did not give him the answer he wanted because he never did it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, true. Because I'm sitting in Tom Cruise's bottom, as it were. <laughs> I, I'm tempted to, um, to defend Scientology. Uh, and many of the people, when I uh, do my sort of Church of Fear gig around the country, many people say, come on, Scientology is no different from all the other religions the Catholic Church, the pedophile disgrace, um, the jihadi edge of Islam, uh, beheadings, murderings, ISIL, all of that. Um, the Buddhists are murdering Muslims in, um, on the edge of Burma. So why are, you, why are you bothering with this thing, which after all gives us one of the greatest motion picture action adventure stars? <laughs> Um, who is in no sense <laughs> whatsoever.
Try, this is serious, okay? It's a serious question. <laughs> I, I guess for me, I, yes, I, hear, I run into that all the time, you know, that, that ICE is, is uh, a high-control organization that is far worse, and there's no question. But I think what I find so fascinating about Scientology is that it's a totalitarian organization that exists inside the United States today. Yes. And inside England, countries that are enlightened and modern and, and, and where we don't have beheadings. And, so, uh, and also the way that Scientology wraps itself in ideals like freedom of religion, um, uh, freedom of speech, and, and ends up using some of our, you know, our bedrock values not as shields, but as weapons to destroy other people. That I find fascinating. That they're, they, This is a very sophisticated group whose um, effects are not always obvious. And the more you dig into it, the more you find the ruined lives, the split up families. Um, and I, you know, I think the reason why our stories always get such a huge response is that it's that combination of celebrity, it's secretive nature, and it's odd beliefs. It's just, it's a, it's a really fascinating but, but also combination. That, that it exists so openly in, in free countries, in so many places. It, it's, it couldn't hide in plain sight any more effectively. It stands there shouting and screaming about how, how free it is. And, and for me, that's the thing which I, there's nothing comparable to it that I, certainly that I can think of in this country or the States or, or the world where you have this, this thing, which, I, it's, for me, it's not a religion, full stop. It doesn't matter what they say. I do not believe it's a religion. Um, where the, the, the property and tax affairs for its businesses, because they are businesses in this country, are channeled through Australia. Nothing's owned in this country. There's no incorporation. There's no company. There's no, there's no charity that, that, is, that is Scientology in this country. If, if, let's say, I was going to be sued because of something one, one, one of you two had written in your books, or for another reason, <laughs> then I, one of the things I would be fascinated to see, and I hope it doesn't ever happen, it might, um, would be who actually sues me. Because if it's not an individual, then the organization might sue, and, and the question of whether or not organizations can sue is, is, is a moot point for now. But which organization would it be? Would it be the one in Australia? Would it be, I, I, don't, know, I don't know who actually that when, we, when I get lawyer's letters, I don't know who they're writing on behalf of, really, because it's well, so opaque that you just, you don't know. And that, well, let's take an example from my book. Uh, my book is about Paulette Cooper, who wrote about Scientology in 1971. And the answer to your question is, everybody sued her, okay? Not, they, they, they imported copies of her book into England so they could then sue her from England. She was sued in England, Canada, Australia, South Africa, United States, several places in the United States. And um, at that point, there was only one entity in each country that did so. But they, basically everybody who could sue her did. She ended up being sued 19 times by the Church of Scientology. And that was only the overt legal attack they had on her. They also had this, you know, Scientology has a spy wing. I don't know how many churches in England have spy wings. But the Church of Scientology has uh, had, in the day, back in the day, something called the Guardian's Office. It was replaced by something today called the Office of Special Affairs. It is very by much... By the way, uh, are you here tonight? <laughs> what kind of a spy uh, wing would they be okay, if they said... Okay, there'd be, uh, there's a sinister-looking bloke over there who just put his hand up. <laughs> uh, there's more than one, actually, but... <laughs> You're not wrong, there's more jobs here. All right. Where is the stand-up God? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, okay. there's, so the answer is they're here. And um, the, the Guardian's office decided to destroy Paulette because she wrote that book. Um, they tapped her phones. They sent smear letters about her to people in her apartment. They sent smear letters to attempt to get her boyfriend fired. They sent operatives to try to get her father's business destroyed. Um, they got her fingerprint on a piece of paper, typed up a bomb threat to themselves, mailed it to themselves. The FBI investigated. She was, fa she was uh, indicted and faced 15 years in federal prison and wasn't fully exonerated until five years later when the FBI raided the Church of Scientology and found all of these planning documents explaining how they were going to frame her and how they attempted again four years later. Um, so 
I guess the answer, the answer to your question is Scientology throws everything at you that they can once they've decided to target you. Uh, and in, in the United States, there are several lawsuits right now that involve a lot of entities all kind of ganging up on people. So it could be a lot of people were, were that go they, after were you. Were they begun by Scientology or begun by someone suing them? Uh, the, one, the one that I can think of where Scientology is not suing people as much as it used to. That's true. Now they're hacking people. They but, <laughs> oh, hold on, you, uh, wait a second. What a dreadful <laughs> allegation. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you're an American where nothing like that happens whatsoever, uh, as, as I'm told by the National Security Advisor <laughs> people. So, uh, by the way, uh, so we, uh, we should all say this, uh, the Church of Dino uh, Scientology deny um, everything uh, that we've said thus far, and the film, and we're all denied uh, and we're all bad people, yeah. suppressive persons. What's the worst thing they've said about you? They call me a parasite, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do they call you? They call you... Uh... I'm a, a wreck of drunken men. Okay. <laughs> Give it a couple it, of hours. <laughs> it's true. Um, uh, it was me and Mike Rinder. We were both wrecks of drunken men or something like this. And I, fine, fair enough. That's a fair description. Well, they, 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 called me, they called me a parasite, but they didn't really complain about anything in my book for, except for one thing. They hate that I mentioned Charlie Manson in it, which they also hate about Paulette's book. Now, Paulette's book came out in 1971, in 1969, the New York Times had broken the news that Charlie Manson had been a Scientologist. And Scientology By the way, for the that. younger people in the audience... Who is Charlie whom, Manson? Of, of, of whom there is nobody. Is he a relative of Prince Charles, this uh, Charles <laughs> fellow? Uh, Charlie Manson was a cult leader who had some young people kill people for him in 1969, including Sharon Tate. And... Um, Anyway, what he so was... So he's not a pillar of the community. No, he, he, was, he, was, he spent most of his life in, in one institution or another. And when he was in prison in, from 63 to 67 up in Washington State, he got into Scientology. There's no question about this. He did something like 150 hours of auditing. Um, last year, there was a wonderful new book about Manson that came out. I don't know if you saw it by Jeff Gwynn. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it. One of the things Jeff did was he went back to that prison to look through their records, and he found that the warden wrote that, well, thank goodness Charlie's into something. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just no question that Charlie Manson was into Scientology. But, uh, so the, the, but the church hates that. So the only thing they've complained about in my book is that one sentence I have in a 400-page book about Charlie Manson. They complained about everything in my book. Um, they haven't got in touch with me to say that. Th Good. Have they? Now, simple question. I think you're being unfair to the church. Okay. Uh, They're far worse than that. Has the church ever um, impacted upon your own life? You know, I, I usually dodge that question, but um, I was recently in the movie Going Clear. Oh, and I have something to say about that. Yeah, oh. say it now. They're not interested. All right. <laughs> they pay well, their BBC license I may be, fee. <laughs> I may be speaking out of school, and I might get in trouble for this, but I just got an email a couple of hours ago asking me to be available for interviews because, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Suspense. Wait for it. <laughs> oh, this is big. This is good. They want me to be available for interviews because Sky will be debuting Going Clear on September 21st. Yay. And now they probably won't want me to be interviewed at all. <laughs> you you so, uh, okay, so don't dodge the question. Have, okay. Has your so, life ever been when I was, So I'm very fortunate. Uh, Going Clear is a movie by Alex Gibney, who's one of the world's best documentary makers today. And Thank you. he Thank made you. it based on... <laughs> he said one of. <laughs> one <laughs> of, <laughs> one of. That's okay. And, uh, and, and he made it based on Lawrence Wright's book, Going Clear, which is a wonderful, wonderful book about Scientology. And uh, it's, basic, it's mostly uh, centers around the lives of eight former Scientologists who span a, a, an incredible uh, time of the church from the 60s to the present day. And they're all fascinating people. And for some reason, they let me in there too to say a few things, mostly about Tom Cruise. And um, so, uh, what was the question about going? Oh, so, so he asked, so at one point, Alice Gibney asked me, have you been harassed? And I, like I said, I usually dodge that question, but I mean, this is Alice Gibney. 
So I did admit to them, yeah, they, they harassed me a lot. And in particular, what I mentioned in the film is they, they would send their chief dirty tricks private investigator to um, go to my mother's house and just sort of accost her, which was not nice. Uh, but they, they've done worse than that. And it's just, I, I don't know, I just consider it part of the job. You know, I don't make it part of my stories as much as, you know, you did with the way they followed you and harassed you. But it's, you know, it's part of the gig, right? Humphrey, what? go and tell the truth. Have you ever feared, you may not be real about this, have you ever feared? Oh, I've feared lots of things, but that's okay, a very the vivid van, imagination. The van outside your house. <laughs> it wasn't a van, it was a man with a camera. Who, oh, I didn't know you got that. Yeah, I didn't talk to him. I don't know for sure where he was, but we live, there's a row of houses, then there's a wall on the other side of the road. And I used to be a journalist. I know what a professional photographer's camera looks like hanging around the neck. And, and there was one standing across the road from our house. When and was this? This was around the time your book came out in early 2013. Coincidence, maybe. Hadn't seen one before, haven't seen one since. But I, I definitely thought, well, yeah, that's, that, that may be. Obviously, I'm not alleging it because I don't know, but I couldn't think of any other reason why. And it certainly did mess with my head a bit, but to be fair, that legal letter probably did so more. That got me more stressed because they said we're going to bring the legal, uh, you know, the worst legal stuff you can imagine uh, down on you and, and for small business, family, etc., etc. Um, these things do tend to stress you. But three months after the book had been published and not a peep had come from them, I'm, I'm over it. No. It, 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 to be fair to the Church of Scientology, because uh, I'm sitting on Tom Cruise's bottom, I was arrested, or detained anyway, by the ISI, the Pakistani secret police in <coughs> Pakistan, and we'd filmed something, we'd probably filmed one of their torture centres by mistake, and they said, who are you? And I said, my name is John Sweeney, I work for BBC Panorama, I said, can you prove that? There was about uh, seven goons. The guy was talking to me, had a very nice suit um, and pitted skin. And he said, can you prove that? And I handed over my passport, my BBC pass. And he gave it to one of the goons who got into a car and drove off into the dust. Then he turned to me and he said, who are you? And can you prove it? <laughs> and I looked him in the eye and I said, my name is John Sweeney and I work for Panorama and I have seven million hits on YouTube, look me up. <laughs> and he went away, he would have seen the, the clip of me arguing with Tommy Davis, and then he came back and he gave me my passport and BBC Press Pass and said, I'm very sorry, Mr Sweeney. On <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank the church. The church for, actually uh, saved, I, saved your life. The, the, the church, Possibly, it, it, it saved my fingernails. Such a um, <laughs> So I, I think you're being too mean about the church. Is it, is it horrible? It's not horrible to ordinary people, is it? it? They don't behead them. They don't sexually abuse them. Uh, generally, it's okay. <coughs> yeah, sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there's supposed no to be there's fucking there's provocative. No, that's my no, role. I know, I know. All right. Okay. The, the, thing, the thing that's changed from from the, day, the days of all this terrible stuff happening to Paulette, um, which is in Tony's book which will shortly be for sale for that. Um, is Are you a publisher? I'm a publisher, yeah. <laughs> we, we sell books. That's, um, <laughs> that's how it works. Uh, is that the internet and a whole lot of Scientologists leaving means that these, this, this network of people now exists who are in touch with each other. But not only that, they can make noise so publicly that doing something like suing a, a journalist, the author of a book, in 19 different places would be monumentally counterproductive because the news of, of, of such a course of action would be around the world within seconds, if not minutes, um, and, and the result of publicity would be horrendously damaging to the church. So the, 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 if they are fighting now, which I'm sure they are in ways we don't know about, they, they'll be doing it, maybe they are, maybe they're not, I don't know, it will be done very subtly and in ways that, that you, you, you probably, you, you'll find very hard to, to know about, I think. As in it won't, be, it won't be in your face in the way. There's no question the internet's been very, very bad for them. Um, Scientology is based on information control. In, in, Hubbard's, yes. in Hubbard's language, he called it a gradient. You're not supposed to learn more than according to the steps he has laid out. And it can take years and hundreds of thousands of dollars 
before you get to the top levels of learning, which is called the OT levels, operating Thetan levels. And these are supposed to be incredibly secret. You, you, you can't get to OT2 until you've been to OT1. You can't get to OT3. You get to OT3, cost you $10,000, they literally bring it out in a locked briefcase, okay? There's this whole production to it. And then in 1995, a couple of knuckleheads put all of that material online. <laughs> and it's been online ever since. And, and, and for Scientology, it's been a disaster. Uh, and they tried, they tried very hard in the 90s to put the genie back in the bottle and sue people. They literally raided people's homes with the use of uh, federal warrants in, in the United States and Europe. And, and ultimately, I think they realized that they just can't do that anymore, and the Internet has won. But the people who are in Scientology still very quickly become part of that information system uh, of control. Uh, I did a series at the Underground Bunker called Up the Bridge with a technical expert named Claire Headley. And she and I, because I'd always heard this, that there are levels and you pay and it gets more and more expensive. But I wanted to know what was each level, what did each level cost, and what was in each level. And we did this level by level from the very beginning. And one of the things I, I, I had not really learned before was that in the very lowest levels, things that are called the student hat, for example, where you learn how to use a dictionary. Um, that, how do you? Well, literally. No, Claire. How do you use a dictionary? You open the fucking book. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are special dictionaries. Claire showed me how the indoctrination begins almost from day one. And that you immediately begin to learn that Scientology has all of the answers. And if there's anything good in your life, it's because of your association with Scientology. And if there's anything bad in your life, it's your own fault, and it's because you've misapplied Scientology. And that becomes a very strong controlling force so that you don't, it doesn't matter that OTs are on the internet. No Scientologist is dare, would dare go look at it because they know they need to follow the gradient. They not only won't look at the material that's been leaked, they won't look at a negative article. They won't watch Going Clear. They won't watch this streaming on the internet because they know that the penalties are severe. Scientology is a snitching culture. It's, it's an interrogation culture. If you see your father watching Going Clear on television, you have an obligation to turn him in with what's called a knowledge report. And they do this all the time. Uh, one of the most remarkable stories we had at the website this year involved a woman named Sylvia DeWall. She had been turned in by a friend, and she then went to be interrogated. Now, I will tell you that the e-meter is a very crude device which simply measures galvanic uh, current differences in your skin, which mean nothing. But to a Scientologist, an e-meter is an infallible tool that can tell when you're holding back information. And as long as you believe that, it becomes a fabulous interrogation tool. Scientologists spill all of their secrets because they believe they cannot hold them back. Sylvia was brought into an interrogation because her friend had turned her in, and her crime? She had watched Leah Remini on Dancing with the Stars. And she had watched Lawrence Wright interviewed on television. And she had sent uh, some emails to Mike Rinder. So this interrogation went on for three weeks at the end of which she received a bill for $4,500. And then they determined that she had said enough that she should be kicked out of the church. And she went to um, an interrogation room at the Flag Land Base in Clearwater, Florida, which is all wired up. And a recording of her being told her fate made its way to me, and I put it on my website. And you can actually hear this young ethics officer explaining to her that her crimes of watching Leah Remini on television and watching Lawrence Wright on television is resulting in her being kicked out. Now, she then explained to him, very upset, you don't know what you're doing in my life. You're going to make my husband divorce me. She, her husband was such a devoted Scientologist, his nickname was literally Mr. Church. And she knew that if she was being kicked out of, of Scientology, in their language, declared a suppressive person, he then would have to cut off all ties to her if he wanted to remain in the church. She went home. He took one look at her and said, you were declared, weren't you? And she said, yeah. And then like a good Scientologist, he sat down to examine the data. And he thought about it, and he thought about it. And then he told me, Tony, I decided my wife was more important to me than the Church of Scientology. 
and they both left. And it was, it was really difficult for them, not just because they were facing the prospect of leaving the church and leaving their friends. Their business was painting the homes of Scientologists. They lost their entire clientele. They had to move across the country and start over again, and they were about you know, mid-40s. They had grown children. And so this was, a, it, although it turned out to be a happy ending, it was devastating for them. And again, it all happened because a friend of hers turned her in because she happened to watch something on television. So, you were asking me earlier about, you know, uh, beheadings and how evil they are. The thing about Scientology is that kind of control over people is so, I don't know, opposite of the values we have in the United States and the United Kingdom. That's what I think is such an insidious thing about this organization. I, I know someone who was, who was born into it, and he got to his mid-20s, um, and just it, none of it made sense to him anymore. He just he, he said he he was if he didn't leave he was going to die because so many years so many things happened happened over so many years he, he would go to school and the guys who was at school with his friends would go home and play football and do whatever he'd have to go back to to his home or on the Santos race wherever and, and and work and he had no kind of childhood in the way we think about a childhood and there are so many people like that in there and, and out there now, and, and an organization which is prepared to treat children in, in that sort of way and to do it so overtly because we know they're doing it, they know we know they're doing it, yet they're allowed to carry on doing it. And so that, that, for me, the, the, compared to beheadings and this sort of thing, obviously they are dreadful, dreadful things. They don't happen here in our country and in the States. And that's, the, that's what, what makes me think that, that, that you, it is something which people like Tony and John should be hammering away at for the simple reason that there are people who are being born, in, born into it and who are in it now who are being treated appallingly, having their lives literally taken away from them, who, who, don't, who would never deserve such a thing, literally born into it. it it's, a, it's a horrific, horrific thing. And if, if there's one thing that Alex, I think, um, regretted about going clear, he had so much material. His first cut, he told me, was four hours long. And HBO, he went to HBO and asked them about a miniseries. They said, no, sorry. I think, I think they're regretting that decision now. But he, they said, no, you need to get it down to two hours. And so he, got a, he did a terrific job in two hours, and it became the most watched documentary in a decade at HBO. And it's going to be coming back into theaters in the United States uh, next month. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and it's got, been nominated for seven Emmys, and, and it's also qualified for Oscars. Um, but he did not talk about the young people. He really didn't tell the stories of people. He, he, wanted to, he wanted to explain the appeal of Scientology and why people join. But there are many people who had no choice. They were brought up in it. And um, it's also important to, that Scientology has a special concept about children. The, Scientology, the basic idea of Scientology is that we're all immortal beings called thetans. And uh, my mentor in the back row will tell you that Hubbard was lisping one day and meant to say Satan's, but uh, that um, <laughs> we're all immortal beings called Satan's that have lived countless times through countless bodies, sometimes male, sometimes female, over billions and trillions of years. And so when you look at a child, you know, you and I might see a developing young mammal which has not got its act together or its brain nodded together correctly, a Scientologist sees an ancient creature in a small package. And so they have, they can, ha they can not always, but they can have remarkable disinterest in their own children. Because in the Scientology conception, that son of yours might have been your father 30 or 40 lifetimes ago. You've just flipped the role. And if children are confused and stumbling um, it's literally because they've, had, they've just come through such a difficult time being reborn and they're still getting their bearings and they will get their bearings, treat them like adults. And so you hear so many stories of parents just literally dropping their kids off at the org, going to do their job and the children have to be raised in these awful cadet orgs. One of the worst was here in England. Uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. Greenfields or Greenstone? It's Greenstone. Greenstone. And um, I did a story with a woman named um, Melissa Paris, you should read if you get time, 
who talked about what a horror show it was to grow up in that school here in East Grinstead. And it was simply because the parents were too busy doing their Scientology to have really any care for their children, but they were told, they're, they're your kids this lifetime, but they won't be your kids next lifetime, and they're fine. But it's important to keep that in mind, you know, uh, and, I, and I will say that they're not all scientists think that, Scientologists think that way. They're, they're very good family people in Scientology, but in general, that's what they think of. So my, my perception of it, of, of the organization as a whole, is that the, the people, lo the lower down the food chain you get within Scientology, the more straightforwardly nice people you find. They're obviously vulnerable, many of them are vulnerable in their own ways, which is why they're, they're in it in the first place. But essentially, the, 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 the stuff that we consider malevolent is, is the fault of a pretty small proportion of, of the organization. I, I haven't I, met I, a Scientologist yet that didn't tell me they got into it because they wanted to improve themselves and, and improve the world. I mean, these are good people that wanted to do good things. And I think that, again, is one of the things Alex set out to do in his film, was to show they're very intelligent, very creative people that got in all for the right reasons, and then within a few years were shocked to find what they were capable to, of doing. Because they buy into the idea that Scientology, that L. Ron Hubbard was literally the only human being who ever figured out how the human mind works and what the universe is doing here, and that we're all living on a prison planet. And that the few enlightened Scientologists are trying to clear the planet and all of the rest of us are too stupid to understand what's going on. They really are, have a very superior attitude about themselves. But they, they get into it hoping to improve their lives, hoping to make the planet a better place. I mean, you've met some, some of the... Like Bruce Hines, for example. Bruce was a physicist before he became a Scientologist. It was a, 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 so Bruce Hines is the man who said, um, I spent 30 years in Scientology, then I left. And then I read, and this man used to audit Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise denies it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he said, I got out and I went online and I read about Robert Lipton, who wrote a book called um, Thought Reform or Brainwashing. Robert Lipton was a brilliant American military psychiatrist who treated American GIs who had been brainwashed by the Chinese communists during the Korean War inside North Korea. And um, he then, he, his, his book was turned into a novel by the journalist um, Richard Condon, the Manchurian candidate, um, which um, became a film. And then the Israelis turned that into their own version with, I think, a Hezbollah or a Hamas a kidnap of an Israeli soldier who becomes almost the Israeli prime minister. And then the Americans borrowed that uh, and turned that into Homeland, which, which just goes to show there is only so many plots in Hollywood. <laughs> but, but what um, Lifton's great insight is um, uh, about brainwashing, the eight tests. Number one, constriction of information. And um, I've been to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, not lately, uh, but certainly the thing, the big frightening thing for the West, for our beautiful open society, is how do we deal with this problem? How do we deal with the jihadis? And doing Scientology is a very strange way, for me anyway, at least, of, uh, it's, to be honest, it's my hobby. But it's also, it helps me understand people who have been brainwashed, and when I come across people um, like Bruce Hines and Mike Rinder, who then leave, I feel this is great because they've been brainwashed and then they've left. And that process, how that happens, that's fascinating. And it's about information and information being light. And, I, and, I, and absolutely, I do feel, I and mean, people may disagree with me, the church may do that, blah, blah, blah. But I think that this is a brainwashing organization. One of my favorite moments um, um, in my North Korea book, uh, Research, was I went to um, Belfast and I tracked down an IRA man, an official, not a provo. Who, oh, oh, sorry, get on with the story, John. Um, anyway, he had been uh, gone uh, to um, North Korea in 1988 to learn how to kill the British, him and six comrades. And I met him in a bar in Belfast, and I'm, um, I've got an Irish surname and I drink Irish whiskey, but I'm English and I work for the BBC still. And he leaned forward, 
who's a big guy, he's quite tense, just met him, and he said, John, I have one thing to tell you. I'm a member of the Church of Scientology. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't really have to explain myself in this room, but I just said, fuck you. (laughs) Uh, And he, 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 he laughed, he was winding me up. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> but going to North Korea was for him the moment his IRA West Belfast brainwashing started to crumble. Because for him, for the first time in his life, he saw that however dark things were for a Northern Irish Catholic Republican nationalist in West Belfast, it was nothing like as dark as ordinary life for North Koreans inside North Korea. This was the moment his brainwashing started to crumble. And this is why um, what we try and write and do, and what Humphrey uh, publishes, and what you try and do, just even by doing here, is actually, I think, slightly more important than... It's important, and it's not a waste of time, because what we're doing is countering a kind of brainwashing, which is one of the legal decisions in 1984. Can you remember which one? One of the judges, Breckenridge or Lacey, both of them... I'd buy you a pint if you were in the pub, but you won't be here because you're almost certainly dead. But, but, um, but that's the that's point. Causes. This is a kind of brainwashing, and that's why we fight it. Well, I've been, I've, you know, one of the things that I've been most grateful about with the bunker, I run this website. In, in 2011, um, I was at the Village Voice, and I started covering the story of... Uh, this bizarre goon squad that was hanging outside the home of a former Scientology official named Marty Rathbun. They called themselves Squirrel Busters. And I thought it was the most remarkable story I'd heard in a long time. And they came back day after day after day. And I thought, you know, there's something going on in Scientology somewhere around the world every day. I bet I could do this and make it like a daily thing. And four years later, I'm still... (laughs) (laughs) Stories back Great to the decision, Tony. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but the, it's called the Underground Bunker now, and, I, and I, it's got a, kind of a life of its own, and I get so much mail from around the world. But the best are those that, that send me messages and say that they were just starting to question. They were looking around. They ran into my website. Um, and sometimes they had a violent reaction to it because I not only write about what David Miscavige is doing and the current organization and the abuses... But I also write about L. Ron Hubbard in a way that makes um, some people who are leaving because of Miscavige are very uncomfortable to see Hubbard criticized. But um, they stick with it, and they look at what people are saying in the comments, and I'm very fortunate that I have amazing people in the comments who know far more than I ever will about Scientology. And the, the discussions are very intelligent. And, you know, I, just this week, I got an email from somebody who I had written a story about and she had lost her parents. Her parents uh, disconnected from her, which is, disconnection is one of Scientology's most toxic policies. If once somebody leaves and for whatever reason is kicked out or made a suppressive person, everybody else has to cut off ties to them, even if it's mother and son, brother and sister. And so this woman had left Scientology and was associating with somebody the church didn't like. And so everyone had to cut off ties with her, including her own parents. And I wrote a story about that. And she never expected to see her parents again. They are members of the C organization where you sign a billion-year contract and cut yourself out from the outside world. But her father had fallen ill, and he had had to spend some time in the hospital. And I'm told that that's one of the few times when you're in the C org that you actually may get some sense of what's going on outside. And he got on the Internet and found that story I had written about his daughter and then called her sister and was just crying like a baby. And the person I wrote about said, now I know how this works, I need to wait a little bit longer, but she really believes that that family will be reunited. So it is about cutting through that programming, that indoctrination, and getting them to see how the church takes good people and spins them in a way that's so against family, against you know their own interests. Um, and, and it's not always easy. I mean, I think there are some families that, you wonder if they're ever going to be reunited. You know, these people are so adamantly, you know, following the rules. Sure, should we have some questions? Questions? Anyone, any, any questions? We can talk all night if you want. Chat. White, the white, white t-shirt. 
There's, there's, yeah, two, yeah. there's two mics coming. Oh, the mics. Oh, that's good. OK. Question to the whole panel. Why do you think Scientology or the church in the United States has not been prosecuted for some of the crimes or the exploits that you've been detailing tonight? Yeah. And are there some that, of which they have been successfully prosecuted for? I think they're, they're, they're... The, the FBI were looking into them when we were making the secrets of Scientology. Yeah. And we knew about that, and, and I thought, that's a story, but I'm not going to report it. He did. Well, yeah, I did because by the time I wrote about it, it was over. Yes. Uh, the FBI investigated Scientology um, for labor trafficking in 2009 and 2010. They knew about the stories about children working 90 hours a week for pennies um, and about families, you know, being separated. And they got so serious about it that by the summer of 2010, they were talking to informants about, would you like to ride in the van with us when we raid the base near Hemet, the, the secretive international headquarters? So the FBI was very serious at that time. And then it fell apart. Um, I differ with Larry Wright and the Tampa Bay Times guys about the reason. Um, they all blame the Headleys. Mark and Claire Headley sued Scientology over those same issues, saying that we were trafficked, we were made to work incredible hours, we were made to cut off all ties to the rest of our family, we were slaves, we were prisoners. And they lost in court because again, the courts just won't deal with uh, Scientology's practices because it calls itself a church. Because the Headleys lost, the one theory goes, the FBI then realized they would have the same problem and they dropped the investigation. The, the, the legal reason was literally because it is in the eyes of the law, a religious organization, which meant that what it did to the Headleys was, was okay, was allowed. If they'd been any other kind of organization, they would have been as guilty as you can get. Right. And it, as in the, the allegations were proved beyond doubt, it was simply the fact that it was a religious organization, which meant that its behavior was, was not legally punishable. I think it was more complex than that. I think um, the investigation was compromised when an FBI special agent um, uh, shared a document in a, in, a, in a civil lawsuit. It's a little complex, but Scientology will look for anything it can then complain to the Department of Justice about. And I think that it, it won the day on that one. But, it, uh, but the Homeland, the homeland uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, what do we call it? The Department of... Uh, it's your country. I know. Department of Justice. It's one of these... It's one of these Homeland Security. One of these 9-11 things. Okay, Homeland Security did yeah. an investigation. They dropped it. Um, the one everybody wants to see happen is for the IRS to revisit the decision in 1993 to give Scientology tax exempt status. I have talked to someone who has uh, been feeding information to um, criminal uh, investigators at the IRS that are, sound very interested. But whether there's enough political will to really revisit that and have the IRS um, investigate that, it's hard to say. There's a lot of inertia there, and it would be difficult to see that happen. Because things, all these organizations know that if they were to start any kind of legal inquiries, let alone actual proceedings, they would be tied up in, in, in appeals and yeah. all sorts of, of legal processes. Law enforcement will tell you they face two big right. problems. The, the, the first big problem is when Scientologists come out, it can take years to recover before they finally realized they were victimized. I mean, Lord, the one that you should all watch that I'm looking forward to is in December, uh, the, tri the, um, lost, the trial of Laura DiCrescenzo's coming up. She's suing Scientology. At 12, she was working 90 hours a week. At 16, she was forced to have, an, 17, she was forced to have an abortion. She's suing Scientology. They have gone to the US Supreme Court trying to keep her from getting doc her own documents in that case. They lost that. She's now going to court with those documents, and it should be a fascinating test. But her whole case is jeopardized because it took her four years after she left Scientology to file that lawsuit. Uh, and it's just that it takes so long to recover. I, I talked to an FBI agent the other day about something regarding Scientology. Don't get too excited. But, and the first thing he said, when I told him about an incident, he said, well, how long ago was that? I mean, that's, it's, it's really difficult for law enforcement because they want to kind of catch Scientology in the act, and yet we, we tend to hear about this awful treatment of children 
years after it happens. That's the biggest problem. Who's, who's handling the microphones? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, great work, by the way, all of you. I've seen Going Clear and your documentary, John, and it's really great work that you're doing and you're out there kind of promoting this uh, sort of actual intellectual uh, assault on such ridiculous things. Anyway, but um, do you it's think... It's not intellectual. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, do, this is to any of you. Uh, do you think that um, Scientology has the kind of lifespan that other religions might have? you know, say, as Islam and Christianity and all that. Do right. you think we'll see Scientology, you know, for another 100, 200 years, or do you think, you know, it's just... A I, I, my view is that it will carry on existing in some form, but in the same way that it changed after Hubbard was no longer in charge, it will change when David Miscavige is no longer in charge, and it is pro it, it's likely to become a very different organisation. I, I don't know... How, what that will mean in, in practice, but I think we can say with pretty solid confidence that it's not going to go from strength to strength over thousands of years in the way that some religions have, or, or you know, exist over thousands and thousands of years in the way some religions have. What do you think, John? Because it's not a religion. I think it's bollocks. <laughs> As I said, I wasn't very intellectual about it. Um, and I think that... A lot of thought went into that. <laughs> the, the, no, I think it's... There are things like theosophy. I don't even know what it was or is, um, but that was something which was very fashionable. Occultism. Um, and these things can do damage. And then there's a moment when um, they, they kind of fall. I mean, when I, what I like to say is... Um, um, so in defense of the big religions for a second, I believe that people should believe in anything or nothing. And you go to somewhere like North Korea, there is there's a political religion, but there is no true um, freedom to believe, and that's wrong. And I defend the right to believe in things, I really do. I defend, and this sounds weird, but I'll say it, that North Korea will never truly be free unless there is a Scientology org in Pyongyang. By the way, all my ex-Scientology friends are completely fascinated with North Korea because they've been inside it. North Korea, some say, the church will deny this, is um, Scientology minus Tom Cruise. Um, um, Scientology is North Korea plus nuclear weapons. But it's the same thing. Number one, restriction of information. Uh, but, but, I, but I feel there is something fundamentally... Uh, so the big religions, Christianity, um, you know what it is. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Islam, follow the prophet. Um, Judaism, marry a nice Jewish girl. Um, <laughs> don't eat bacon sandwiches. I'm not... I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a theologist. However... <laughs> Uh, Scientology tells lies about what it is. Tom Cruise, if he was sitting here, and he clearly hasn't turned up, um, much of a disappointment, would say that it helps you communicate, but deep down they believe that 75 million years ago space aliens were massacred by Lord Zeno in volcanoes um, by hydrogen bombs, and the uh, remains of these dead spa uh, pesky space alien souls have stuck to us and contaminated us, and only Scientology can break us. I think that's all pretty simple. It's bollocks. And I think over time, people... This is what we've seen is a fantastically rich confidence trick, which still works for some people, many of whom are second or third generation. But I think ultimately um, it, it will fade. And it's, not, it's not growing. It's not, it's go, not it's growing. Not grow. It's... Um, uh, I was going to say something arrogant there. So I've almost sold more books of Church and F of Fear than there are members of the Church of Scientology. <laughs> and if you'd like to buy one... <laughs> and if you put the sales of both our books together, we're getting close. So the good... Patri not patriotic, that's the wrong thing to say. The people who ran away from our wonderful country and formed their own... <laughs> Frankly, rather bold. By the way, square brackets. Where does Donald Trump stand on Scientology? Is that a reason? Uh, there are lots of natural Trump supporters in the audience tonight. Uh, 
Okay, the answer's um, not interesting. Yes, you have um, to comment. So, yeah, if you want to buy a book, that would be great. And then we could defeat this monster. The, the thing I think, that when those two Scientologists were allowed to get married on Scientology premises in this country, that was, I thought it might be the first, the first in a line of, of, of small legal victories that they won. And my instant reaction was, well, that's a bit, I'm not, you know, not too happy about that. But actually, when you think about it, if to, and, 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 and looking back, my instant reaction was wrong. If two adults want to get married somewhere, then who am uh, I to the, tell them that, oh, they, that they shouldn't, frankly? They said, the church said, this is proof that Scientology is a religion but, but it, it in, was, in the United Kingdom. Hold on a it second. It was no such thing. It was Hold simply, simply the law I, saying you two have the right to get married where you want. You're my fucking agent. You shut up. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a... Uh, he'll get me back later. You can, these days, you can get married in Tesco. Because you can get in the dog food aisle next to the cat food. Because you can get married in Tesco does not make Tesco a religion. And actually, that would be a bad thing, because they would pay even less tax than they do now. Um, and so, and, but what they did do was, and there's a story in the Daily Telegraph, blessings not be upon it, that, that, that actually... <laughs> That, 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 that this was proof that Scientology is a religion. And it's a classic example of Scientology tweaking a minor victory into a colossal, universal, global success. And it's not true. It is still, in the United Kingdom, not a religion. To me, it's a shop. What do you think? Well, I thought that case was more about England's outdated marriage laws than it was about Scientology anyway. Uh, yes. I think they're forward-looking and, and, and modern marriage. Oh, okay, well. But I was more... Us, by the way, you've never beaten us at cricket, so... <laughs> okay. More interesting to me was who they were. You know, uh, Luis's father, Peter Hodkin, is... You know, one of science. <laughs> this guy is one of Scientology's, you know, sharpest attorneys. It's always, always at the forefront of their various legal attacks. So, I mean, this was very much a church initiative. And her groom, Ale Calcioli, is nephew to Neil Gaiman. Um, and which brings up the whole Gaiman family, which is fascinating. David Gaiman was the face of Scientology for 30 years in this country. And Neil himself, at one point, was executive director of the Birmingham Org um, before he became one of the world's most famous science and, uh, fiction and fantasy authors. And it's, fan it's really fascinating to me that he can't really talk about that today because his mother is still deep into it, his sisters are still very much into it, and his nephew became a symbol for marriage in, in England. So there, that was just a very fascinating story to me. I wasn't too worried about what it said about Scientology's place in England. I, I think it's very clear that Scientology is on fumes in this country. At the last census, I think there were, what, 2,000 Scientologists in the entire country? And this is supposed to be one of their strongholds, right? <laughs> I mean, they claim hundreds of thousands of Scientologists, and it's just not the case. I think the best evidence that Scientology is in big trouble, going back to the question, is how much effort David Miscavige is putting into this whole ideal thing. If, if David Miscavige was confident in the health of his organization, the last thing he'd care about is what we think of his facilities. And instead, he's madly replacing every church around the world to try to convince everybody that the church is expanding. And it's just sleight of hand. He's taking a drab facility and replacing it with a nice one and saying, look, we have a bigger church now. But the people aren't expanding. The people are dwindling. And... I agree with you. There will always be people fascinated with L. Ron Hubbard and his ideas. And a thousand years from now, Scientology, you know, Hubbard will be considered like you know, uh, Amy Simple McPherson and the rest of them. But Scientology is not just a simple interest. It's this very complex organization that always requires constant new people, constant inflow of, of cash. That is breaking down. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's getting difficult to keep that engine going. Do you have another question? Who's got the microphones? Oh. Hi. Um, it doesn't seem to me like Scientology has that many 
distinguishing features, unfortunately. From a philosophical point of view, Buddhism seems to also not have a deity, but more like a messiah figure. And obviously from the harm point of view, um, Mormons and Hasidic Jews seem to also employ some of the techniques that you were talking about in terms of uh, making people be cut off from everybody who leaves their religion and such. Does it ever occur to you that maybe instead of trying to um, assert that Scientology is definitely not a religion, we should just strip all religions from all the benefits that, and exemptions that we give them as a society and just treat them as in an organization? should be treated. Oh, so so treat, treat, treat all religions the same. Tax uh, them all. Ta tax them all. Um, I, I, I'm an atheist, so I find it very... <laughs> but... <laughs> I don't want to go around telling people what they should or shouldn't believe. I mean, I'd love to, but I, can't, I won't. Um, and I think if you, if you have, you can name any, any religion, as John mentioned a few earlier, which have good and bad parts to them. And if, if, if societies, countries, authorities are, are, are trying their best to weed out the bad bits constantly, because I know, these, you know humans are humans, humans are weak, humans do bad things, so the bad bits of all these religions are constantly happening and constantly regenerating on, on different scales. And as long as they're being monitored and, and people are trying to ensure that these religions are, are, are pure, it's possibly the wrong word, but doing things properly, then, and if a, and if a country decides that, that religions should be, should be exempt from tax on that basis, then it's not for me to say that, that they shouldn't be, especially if they can prove that, the, that what money they have is being used, for, used in the right way. But... You look at something like Catholicism as, as, a, as a pyramid from the very top down. The, the, the bad parts are very small parts, really, relative to the size of the whole thing. And, I, and I'm not belittling any of the suffering anyone went through, but what I'm simply saying is that it's not the entire thing. It's not like it's, that it's imposed from above and, 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 and filters down through, through the whole organisation. Scientology, to me, that is, is that. It's rotten from the top down, all the way through. And if, an, if another religion is shown to be rotten in the same way, then I would say it should not have any kind of benefits whatsoever and, and, and the law enforcement authorities, tax authorities, whatever kind of authorities you've got should be looking at it very closely and getting very busy with, with speaking to people who've been through bad things. Um, so for that reason, I think Scientology is different to other religions. And I think we have to respect people's rights to, to, to believe in what they believe in. And, and I would respect people's rights to believe in Scientology in any way they want. But when it comes to the suffering that the organisation imposes on other people who don't ask for it, who are conned and hoodwinked into getting involved in something, then that's, that's, that's not something that, that, that you can treat, I think, the same way as a, a rotten part, small part of a, of a bigger religion when the rest of it is actually a positive force for good in the world. And I say that as an atheist. So. Uh, Alex Gibney asked me something somewhat similar to that in the film, Going Clear. Your because that's, that's one of the first things that comes up is, you know, don't all religions have strange beliefs? Don't they all have questionable practices? And I told him that for me, what makes Scientology so interesting and worth paying attention to is that the other, some of these other organizations, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they can explain what they believe in a minute or two. And although there's clearly a lot more to learn if you decide to become a Christian for 30 years, that essential belief of what brings people together never really changes. Scientology is nothing like that. They tell you at the beginning that it's a self-help philosophy that's going to help you with your communication. Seven or eight years later, you're paying seven or eight hundred dollars an hour to remove invisible alien souls from your body. <laughs> And they would never tell you that up front. And that's the problem I have with it, is it's so, it's, it's so um, deceptive about what it does. John told you earlier about OT3, which gets all the attention. I, I, it's so unfair that Xenu gets so much attention. I like OT4, okay? Once you're, <laughs> once you're, done, once you're done with OT3, these operating Thetan levels cost anywhere between 10 and $50,000 each. OT4, 
You know, on OT3, you learn that you have all these invisible alien souls attached to you, left over from the Xenu genocide 75 million years ago. And you drive them away with the E-meter. Great, I'm free. OT4, you find out there's a whole other set of them, <laughs> and they're junkies. <laughs> and so you literally have to put them through rehab. And L. Ron Hubbard writes that the pre-clear, the pre-OT is going to tell you, but I don't abuse drugs. I've never done any of the... It doesn't matter. Your, your BTs are a bunch of junkies. Not only were they heavy users, but they were using some kind of space coke that we haven't even invented yet <laughs> in some other galaxy. And you've got to literally dry them out one by one, hundreds and thousands, for hundreds of dollars an hour. This is why I find Scientology so fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I think I think patient, I think I think I think people who see psychotherapists are, are in a slightly different position vis-a-vis -vis free will and and payment for services than than people at the lower reaches of Scientology are. M but I know I know what you mean. I mean the functions aren't aren't incomparable. We we should have some more. Well, I have a simple take on this, which is this: is and it's embarrassing. Uh, I went to the Hay Literary Festival and gave my talk about Scientology Church of Fair. And I had too much to drink in the green room afterwards. And the, arch, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, and I always get his name wrong, it's Rowan Atkinson. <laughs> um, it wasn't Rowan Atkinson, it's the other guy. What's his name? Brilliant. Yeah, anyway, he looks like God. And, um, and I had a lot to drink. And I said, the thing about you, Archbishop, X, is that um, I admire you because when you left the Church of England, uh, you said, I apologise for all the mistakes I've made. And I thought that was really good for a religious leader to apologise for his mistakes. Um, and, and he said, thank you. And I said, and the other thing is, I bet you've never said you suck cock on Hollywood Boulevard, <laughs> uh, which is allegedly what David Miscavige says. Uh, um, and I'm desperate to get to the pub now to get out of this anecdote. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm aiming at is that um, what, it was a gag actually that Sandy Smith, who was the editor of Panorama when the first one went out, the, uh, Scientology and Me, and he wrote the last line of the show, which was great, which was, Scientology, if you get something out of it, well, good luck to you. But as far as we're concerned, they won't be presenting songs of praise anytime <laughs> soon. I can't imagine the Church of England ever sensing, sending private eyes uh, against you, as they've done to, uh, to me, uh, or to, 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 um, to Tony's mother, or whoever the builder in the van was outside Humphrey's house. But, and all, all psychotherapy, I'm not going to defend psychotherapy, I had a psychotherapist once, and I realised it was more cost effective for me to buy a toaster. But, <laughs> but Psychotherapy doesn't, as an organisation, as a thing, hire private eyes to spy on people who dare criticise it, as the lady behind the lady who made the point <laughs> beautifully expressed the freedom to discuss psychotherapy with no real problem. So, I don't think it's like that. I do feel it's especially dark and doesn't deserve to be considered to be religion because it's pay-as-you-go. In my book, there's no such thing as a pay-as-you-go religion. We should do some more questions like three or four, and I should shut yeah. up. <laughs> Hi, really interesting talk, guys. Um, I wanted to focus on what Tony Ortega um, was saying right near the start um, on uh, Scientology not being a religion given its money orientation. And I'm interested to know what you therefore think of people like Joel Osteen and um, the, um, the Prosperity Gospel. So, similar idea, but not Scientology. Um, I think that ultimately is going to come back to the definition of religion, which has obviously been an ongoing theme. And I wanted to raise an interesting point from a talk that was here quite some time ago about the Advertising Standards Authority here in the UK. The comparison was drawn between um, a complaint about an ad that um, depicted um, a Catholic imagery and made it somewhat sexual, so subverted Catholic imagery, and there were three or four complaints, and the ad was struck. 
Any other basis for a complaint needs hundreds or thousands of complaints for the ad to be struck. So the problem there, um, just like the problem you're saying with Scientology and potentially with Joel Osteen, seems to be that with no definition, everyone errs on a very, very broad um, sort of cautionary, oh, well, we'll just do it because we really don't understand what the problem is and it's just easier to go ahead and say, that's fine uh, or that's not or whatever because we don't really understand what religion is. We can't pin it down and therefore we can't actually make a black and white decision that has any legal weight. So I'm curious to know what you think about Joel Osteen and the prosperity gospel and whether or not that sort of has the same idea and whether that ties in with what you were saying about um, the definition of religion, particularly with regards to 501Cs in the States. Well, I don't have much respect for any ministers that put so much emphasis on money the way Osteen does and some of these other charlatans in the United States. I don't... But I, again, I don't know how that affects the definition of religion. I, I think, again, the, the definition of religion is so, it's like sand through your fingers. What's a, what's a cult to one person is a, is a religion to another. What's a religion to one person is a business to another. Uh, and I think, it, I think you just go around in circles and it's a big waste of time. To me, what's important is that Scientology sells itself as a self-help organization to help you with your communication and several years later, your family's ripped apart, you're completely bankrupt, uh, and, and you're wondering what the hell happened. And then they kick you out. And then if you say something, then they try to destroy your life. So, you know, again, we could argue about whether that's a church or a religion or not, but I'm more interested in talking to the people whose lives have been destroyed and to ask them how that happened and try to help them re you know, reunite with their family. The, th the thing that struck me about, about what you said about these, these guys in the States, you, you can, the argument about what is or isn't a religion probably ultimately comes down to what one person says they feel about something, really. There's, there's, no, there's no way of, I think, ultimately cutting through it. I can say what I think, you can say what you think, but really that's what it boils down to. But what you can tell is when someone or, or an organisation is taking advantage of other people, be it financially or in terms of time or whatever, you can tell when that's going on. And that enclosed bit... Because it can only, you know, it could be one, one minister and the people who, who, who he looks after or, or, or who, who listens to him. You can tell when some kind of abuse is, is going on there. That doesn't necessarily mean the whole thing isn't and shouldn't be considered a religion, in, in my eyes. Um, and as, as I was saying earlier, the point about Scientology is it's different because that, that enclosed culture of, of, of taking advantage of, of people and possibly abusing them comes from the very top. So that, for me, is why it's different. Well, and now they're going through a real crisis because at least uh, in past days, the pressure to give money was to, for your own journey, up what's called the bridge to total freedom. Give us a, several thousand dollars so you can pay for your next three levels. Give us $50,000 and you'll get all the way to OT. But it was always give the money so you can advance. Now it's just give us the money because we need it. And... It's, they're all being asked to donate to something called the International Association of Scientologists, and it's like a video game. You've given us 50,000, if you give us 100,000, you get this special plaque and you're called patron meritorious or whatever the hell they call it. And it, all the emphasis is on give us money for our projects of building buildings, and they're no longer moving up the bridge. I mean, the difference is radical. And again, I think it's another sign that that, that, that machine is breaking down. We, we should do... I, I'm sorry? David Miskovich has ruined the whole shop. People used to be giving benefits from it. But this guy's an evil bastard. And he's ruined his health. His old people are taking on his health. People aren't getting wins. As you say, now Hubbard says no. The way you get your money is it provides a service. People benefit. That's how you get wins. Now it's totally changed what you say. Can you tell us up here what he was saying? Uh, this, yeah, th th this, is, this is a very, uh, I hear this a lot from people who felt that um, what I was just describing, that L. Ron Hubbard wanted you to spend money so you could move up this uh, scheme of courses. Hubbard died in 1986. By then, a young man named David Miscavige had already exerted control over the organization. You gotta give him some credit. He's been running the thing for 29 years. Most organizations like this don't survive the death of their founder. But as he's gone along, he's pushed out a lot of people 
who don't like his current policies and feel that he's mucking up what Hubbard had done earlier. And so a lot of the people, he's got an exodus on his hands. A lot of longtime loyal members who are used to paying a lot of money are leaving because they don't like the extreme fundraising that, Hub, that Miscavige is doing, that he's changing some of the tech in ways that, he does, that they don't like. And so people come out and they will tell you that what Hubbard had was valuable and Miscavige is ruining it. Uh, and I, I, I meet a lot of people that feel that way. However, some people will come out saying that and I'll come back to them a year later and so are you auditing on your own outside the church? Oh no, Tony, I sold all the books. So some, some people will remain uh, loyal to Hubbard. I mean, there are people that have been outside of the church who are still auditing outside of the church 30 years later. Other people come out and they keep on going out. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to talk to them either way. I think either, either scenario is a big problem for David Miscavige, and that's why I think he's facing a day of reckoning. Yes, we, we, should, uh, uh, we, go, which pub are we going to? The Old Nick. The Old Nick. Um, it's Satan worship is okay, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, so one last question. Um, yeah, my questions about David Miscavige and the people at the top, do you view them as being folk who are coldly and cynically running a business and knowingly peddling bullshit? Or do you see them as true believers who genuinely take it all as gospel? So I mean, I don't, I don't know what they told you, John, but when I talk to Rinder and Rathbun and some of the others about that, they, Rathbun will tell you that Miscavige really believes in the tech and in Hubbard and in, uh, despite the fact that he's changing things, um, how, did you did, did you get the same thing from them? I, 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 there was a, a there was a copper on you who's in the uh, the West Midlands um, whatever it was serious crime squad, uh, which was eventually busted because of corruption. Um, uh, but um, we're given, we've been given pictures of uh, good people here. Uh, anyway, he said I dealt with con men, and the thing about the really good con men was they believed in the con. So the answer to your question is yes and no, both at the same time. I think at some, at, at some and also there are moments in my life when I've realized I've been conned and I am, or, or I'm in the process of being conned, and part of me looks at myself almost like an out-of-body experience and thinks, hold on a second, John, you're being conned here. But the co psychological consequences of accepting that I've made a terrible mistake are so damaging that you don't want to admit to that. So at the same time, and I think this is what happens in Scientology, people who were in Scientology when I uh, did my screaming thing, I apologize then, I apologize now, were, were, uh, and I should say that with more conviction, um, <laughs> say, I can remember thinking, oh, isn't that dreadful? And also at the same time, there's something wrong, uh, and that's, in a sense, one of the proudest moments of my life, that, uh, that, that you help push that. So the answer is yes and no. They know, I think Miscavige himself knows that he's, what he's doing is wrong, and at the same time he believes that he's saving humanity. It's and and let, me just add, let me just add one thing to that. If Miscavige is a believer, where does that put Cruz? And I, I wondered this question, if maybe Miscavige is just in awe of Tom Cruise and sucks up to him. And, but I got it straight from John Brousseau. John Brousseau was David Miscavige's brother-in-law. John Brousseau um, worked with Tom Cruise, renovated his cars. Nobody knows these two like John Brousseau. And the way John Brousseau put it to me was, Tom Cruise worships David Miscavige like a god. They are convinced they are the only two big beings on the planet, which is a prison planet, and they're superior to the rest of us. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, Talking of prison planets, should we sell the books in the pub? <laughs> can we do it here? Because I need to. Oh, right, yeah, we can sell them at the back, which will probably make no, no, them a no, little no, easier. The answer is no, we do it here because he told me to. Okay, he told you to do it here. Well, thank you very much. I, if you didn't get a photo opportunity before, I've printed out a couple of masks for each of our, uh, our panellists here. So we'll, we'll give a big thank you and we'll hold you up masks uh, for John Sweeney, uh, Humphrey Hunter, and, and Tony Ortega. And thank you all for coming along. Uh, we'll be resuming London Thinks on the 1st of September uh, with Stephen Keane talking about uh, the downfall of our economy and everyone else's economy. 
Uh, Humphrey Hunter will be selling uh, books at the back. Come and meet us or meet us down the pub afterwards, which is the Old Nick, which is just off Red Lion Street. Thank you very much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.